Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this virtual event, the latest in Third Ways series on our rapidly evolving political and economic realities in the age of COVID-19. Uh, my name is Akuna Cook, and I'm a senior fellow here at Third Way. To provide a little bit of context for the audience, this event was actually scheduled two weeks ago. And the original idea was to start the discussion on what a COVID-19 recovery should look like. Since then, we've had a several high profile murders of black people at the hands of vigilantes and, and police that have sent the country into a racial justice crisis. And we couldn't have lined up a more perfect uh, panel than Mitch Landrew and Wes Moore to discuss the ongoing racial justice crises in our country. Before I introduce them, a bit of housekeeping for the audience. Um, you can ask questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And uh, just let us know who you're directing the question to. And you can ask questions throughout the entire uh, program. Um, we've got a full discussion today, so let's dive in uh, with introductions. So first, Mayor Mitch Landrieu served as mayor of New Orleans from 2010 to 2018. He previously served as lieutenant governor of Louisiana from 2004 to 2010. His father, Moon Landrieu, was mayor of New Orleans from 1970 to 1978 and a leading civil rights pioneer. Mitch was actually the first white mayor elected since his father, Moon, um, in 1978 when he was elected in 2010. Uh, Mayor Landrieu is the founder of E Pluribus Unum Fund, which works to bring people together across the American South around the issues of race, equity, economic opportunity, and violence, proving the American motto that out of many, one, and we are better for it. Um, he evoked this fa uh, phrase in his famous speech, marking the removal of Confederate statues from the city of New Orleans in 2017. His journey on race is exquisitely captured in the book, In the Shadow of Statues, A White Southerner Confronts History. E Pluribus Unum Fund recently released the Roadmap to an Equitable Response, Recovery and Resilience, a set of policy proposals to address the racial and economic disparities we see daily. Wes Moore, is the CEO of Robin Hood, one of the largest anti-poverty forces in the nation. Before becoming CEO at Robin Hood, Wes was the founder and CEO at Bridge EDU, an, an innovative tech platform addressing the college completion and job placement crisis. Wes is a best-selling author, a combat veteran, and social entrepreneur. He's also on the board of the Black Economic Alliance. His first book, The Other Wes Moore, a New York Times bestseller, focused on the line between success and failure in our communities and in ourselves. That story has been optioned by Oprah Winfrey and HBO to be made into a movie. He's also the best-selling author, uh, best author of the best-selling books, The Work, Discovering Wes Moore, and This Way Home. He's got a new book coming out next week with Erica Green, Five Days, The Fiery Reckoning of an American City, focused on the uprisings in Baltimore that followed the murder of Freddie Gray at the hands of the Baltimore Police Department in 2015. It's an honor to have both of you joining us this morning. Yeah. I want to start with you, uh, Mayor Landrieu. Uh, a running th theme through your book is this idea that distorting history plays a role in our failure to confront the inequities in our economic, education, criminal justice, and housing systems that persist today. As you've gone through your own journey on race, as we all must do, as we all must and do, um, what role do you think confronting history can play in addressing the inequality we still see today? And what's the best way to do that? Well, first of all, thank you for the third way and thank you for having us. I'm thrilled to be with you and to my really dear friend, Wes Moore, who I have great admiration for. It's great to be with you today. And I look forward to uh, a truthful and poignant and open discussion about the most traumatic issue that faces America, which is race. And my admonition, if you will, or my invitation to the white community in America is unless we deal with this, we deal with it and go through it, that it's going to be very hard for America ever to attain the aspiration that all of us promised to each other, that out of many, we are one, or that we're all created equal. This is, this is the thing that continues uh, to inhibit America from becoming what we've all promised to be. The other day, I was on a, uh, amazingly, on a, on a, a Zoom fest with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Well, after I figured out how to talk in his presence, because I was awed by being with him, he said something that he used a, an analogy that nobody had used. He said, racism is like dust. Um, and it's just there and it's everywhere. And then when you turn the light on, you begin to see how it permeates everything that we do. Our inability to deal with it is a direct result of not knowing our full history. 
or having a narrative that was created that creates a way for you to think about something that doesn't make you deal with what actually happened. The examples of Legion, Brian, the great Brian Stevenson talks about this more than anybody, but everybody remembers that, you know, it was said that, you know, who, he who wins the war gets to create the narrative. Uh, well, what happened in the South was the people that lost the war got actually to create the narrative around the Confederate monuments and created a myth called the lost cause, which indicated to people that, you know, the South really wasn't trying to separate itself from the union. It really wasn't about slavery. All the things that people said that happened, you know, were not really as bad as they were. The lynchings really weren't lynchings, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you jump forward to today and now we have cameras that really are showing everything that's happened and their comments going on about clearly when they want cameras, but now that you have them and you can see them for, your, for themselves, you can see now the difference between what's written in a police report and what actually happened just last night. Uh, in Buffalo, there were a number of police officers walking down the street in formation and an older white man walked up to them. They pushed him down. He hit his head. He was bleeding. What happened was one of the officers tried to stop and pick him up. Another officer said, no, that's not what we do. And in that moment, you saw police officers that were not appropriately trained, police officers that did not have a culture of helping each other and stopping. And, and writ large, you then had a story that was told by the police department that the man tripped. Well, you can just stop right there. You don't even have to go to George Floyd to say, well, that's a symbol of not being trained the right way, not doing what a two-year-old normally would do, um, and telling it the wrong story so that people who weren't listening and weren't seeing or couldn't really know, didn't really know what the right thing to do was. And so throughout history, and this just isn't about police and how we react to police and trying to find a good relationship between the community and police, which is possible. This is really about the biggest story about being honest about what we did, what happened, what the consequences were, how they continue to impact us today, how they continue to have negative consequences, not just on the African-American community, but primarily, but also on everybody else as well, and how we have to now stop for a moment. We have to stop in this moment and confront and see and understand and know exactly what is happening so that we can deal with it in an appropriate way and get all of us to a better place. Thank you. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Wes, you're, you have this book coming out next week that talks about the uprisings in Baltimore following the death of Freddie Gray. Do you have a, do you have a sense that this moment is different, that this could be a turning point? Or do you think that there's a, a, a possibility that you know, just like after Baltimore, that things sort of, you know, there's a, there's a moment where we're all focused on it and it kind of dies away. And how do we ensure that that doesn't happen? What, what are your thoughts on, on this particular moment? Uh, and, and first, first to, uh, to, to all of you to, and to, to Akuna, thank you uh, so much. And, and, and to, uh, to my, my friend uh, and, and hero and mentor, uh, Mary Landrieu, anytime I get a chance to be around you, I'm better because thank of you, it, uh, whether it's virtually or in person. So, uh, so Me it's as great well. to Thank you. And, uh, you know, and, and, and Akuna, you know, it's, it's, it's a really important question. And I think the honest answer about, you know, will this moment be better? The answer is we must make it better. It's not inevitable. And I think that's actually been some of the lessons that we've seen from other occurrences and other instances that have happened that we've allowed the moment and we've allowed time to be our greatest, to be our greatest enemy in terms of making progress. You know, when Dr. King talks about the moral arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice, it doesn't bend there just because. It doesn't bend there because there's an, an inevitability of it. It bends there because there are people on the other side who are pulling with all their might to make sure that it bends towards justice. And, and, and when we talk about justice in this, I think it's important that we also stress and emphasize what we mean by that. Because it is justice for Mr. Floyd. It's justice to make sure that the people who are responsible for the taking of his life are held accountable in a way that Frank, and I think Mary Lynch did a beautiful job of illustrating the fact that that is not the case. Oftentimes, when you're looking at these police involved shootings, you look at, you look at, or police involved interactions. I mean, you look at Baltimore City as just one example. And the reality of Baltimore City is before Freddie Gray, if you just look at the 24 months before Freddie Gray, um, there was Anthony Anderson, and there was Chris Brown, and there was Tyrone West, similar situations where you had people where uh, an interaction with law enforcement led to a person's death, 
And in no way, shape or form was there any either justification or, or equal me measurement of force being used. And so you see how these things then happen and that this demand for justice occurs, but the demand for justice cannot just simply be about an individual case. We demand justice for Mr. Floyd and his family. But we also demand justice that means that we need to have a real and honest conversation about police reform inside of this country and why we do have significant frailties in the way we go about policing police and, and the historic legacy behind that. We know that justice must also mean economic justice. You know, for black college graduates on average earn less than white high school dropouts in this country right now. Whites who have dropped out of high school have a median net worth greater than Blacks and Hispanics who are college graduates. If you look at health data, it shows that Black and Brown Americans are dying at twice the rate of white Americans from coronavirus, and Black women are 42% more likely to die from breast cancer than white women. If you look at data on justice, you know, one of every three Black boys that, are born, that were born in 2001 could expect to go to prison during their lifetime compared to one in every 17 white boys. The, the data is screaming at us that if we are not, as the mayor said, if we are not willing to attack race, if we cannot act like this is just a passing thing or a lane, this is not a lane, it is a lens. It is a fabric in which the nation has been built. And so as we're thinking about that, pulling that, stressing that, we have to make sure that justice and the, and the justice that we demand takes on all forms in this moment. Acuna, if I might, let me just, sure, I want to I um, amplify many of the things Wes said, and I, and I adopt all of them, uh, if I could, Wes. Just a couple of things to be clear, especially to the white people who are listening. And I said that on purpose because, you know, white people get really uncomfortable when you say white people. And I can feel people squirm when I give speeches and say white people because most white people are not referred to that often. And the first thing I tell them is, you know, we really force our African-American friends and people we don't know to wear their blackness every day. They're reminded of it every day and it's uncomfortable. So now that I called you a white person and you felt that uncomfortableness, maybe it can give you some empathy and acknowledgement that if you have to be aware of it every day, it's a burden that you would not want to bear. And I want to speak to that same thing when we say about justice, because it, it sounds ethereal when you say Dr. King said the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. And then Wes added, a modern day version, but it but doesn't bend on its own. Somebody's got to do the work. Really, what is justice? And why is it something that people refer to all the time? And I'll tell you a bit about one of my journeys. When I was a, growing up, I, I did a lot of reading and I was reading about Malcolm X and a lot of um, other folks and this mantra, no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace. Back in the 60s, people heard that, white people heard that as a threat. Mm -hmm. If you don't give me what is deservedly mine, I'm gonna take it from you by any means necessary, right? And so the history and the narrative about what that meant and who it was, it was almost like an act of aggression that white people heard. When essentially it, it is nothing more than a statement of truth. It's like saying, you know, when the sun rises, it gets bright. It is a truth where there is no justice, no peace. So let me, let me kind of frame this out for uh, the people that are listening. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain alienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we talk about liberty and justice for all. See, these are, these are our original promises to each other. And justice simply means that what you get, I get. What you have an opportunity for, I get an opportunity for. When we both break the same law, we both get treated the right way. When we have an economic opportunity, we both have an equal opportunity. When uh, something happens, you don't get the privilege of going first just because of the color of your skin. That, that lack of justice permeates, as Wes clearly articulated, almost every institution. So I just said institutional. I mean institutional racism. It doesn't mean that everybody that's in all of the institutions is a hateful racist who's going to go lynch somebody. It means that you may be unknowingly uh, or unwittingly, or maybe intentionally participating in creating a system that gives you an unfair uh, advantage. And so as a consequence, where there is no justice, people who feel aggrieved, who don't feel like they're being given their fair share, are out of peace with you. 
they're out of communion with you. There is alienation. And as a consequence, because there's alienation, I don't mean to be too simplistic here, <laughs> we're not working together. We can't turn the double plate. We can't build the building together. We can't build the uh, entrepreneurial together because we are separate. So where there is no justice, there is separation. That's what, that's what that is. And peace, by the way, is not the absence of violence. Peace is the inability to have a communion between and amongst people who are fighting a common cause for, for a common reason that benefits us all. So that's what that means. And white people have been trained to hear things differently. And I think the African-American community, through their words, their deeds, and their actions, are saying, you cannot look away from the thousands of examples. I'm going to give you one more that I think will resonate with all of you that I hope the white people on, on, on this call will really kind of get. COVID comes in. COVID wafts across the entire country. It falls on people or it gets on us the way Tony Fauci, who you should listen to, says it gets on you, okay? And you can say, well, gee, COVID is an equal opportunity herder because it doesn't distinguish between falling on black people or falling on white people. And that is true. That is a scientific fact. However, it is absolutely clear that the consequence for African-Americans has been dramatically different in the impact that it has had. And there are lots of different reasons why that occurred, but that is a fact. So you have to then say to yourself, well, gee, if, if the virus does that, you know what? So would a new law or a regulation that perhaps mm -hmm. the third way would pass. And the African-American community would say, you know, you third way people, y'all are milquetoast, you know, because y'all are really not speaking right to the issues because that can be what's called in the law, a disparate impact, a law that is identical, but it can, have, which is, of course, brings us to the difference between equality and equity and what that really means. And I'm saying this to, to all of you to say, this is not rocket science. This is not something that we don't know about. This is not something that we don't have specific answers to. This is a matter about us willfully trying to fix. I wanna say a, a trigger word here for all the white people, repair, the, go right to reparations, okay? Because when people hear, especially white people hear reparations, they hair if they have it, not like me, you know, uh, they cut, catches on fire. And you say, what is controversial about the notion of picking up what you dropped or fixing what you broke or repairing what you damaged? That is not, now, and so how you, how you fix what is broken actually could fall into some very thoughtful, reasonable, run-of-the-mill things about investing in neighborhoods, investing in housing, making capital available, having a criminal justice system that is fair, all of those things fall into the category of repairing the damage that has been done through the institutional design of systems that have had a disparate impact that have landed on America and created an injustice and therefore created alienation. And you see, it's not that complicated. It's just a matter of will, open-mindedness, and being willing to fix what we broke. I'm sorry for going on so long, but I don't want to pass this moment up without confronting and being completely open and then giving people a pathway to a better place. That, that was beautifully said. It's, it's ironic. My brother actually texted me a few minutes before this and said, I just heard a white lady on TV suggest that we might need to look into reparations. <laughs> and, he said, wow. he said, and he said, I never thought that was going to, you know, I never thought I'd see that happen. And so I, I think it speaks to what you were just saying. Well, can I just, just one more comment for white people think reparations is this crazy thing. After World War II, the United States of America helped rebuild Europe with the Marshall Plan. We repaired the damage that we helped participate in and helped lift up other folks. We've done this historically over time. So it's not, it's not I know that word has a, has a racial connotation that really kind of hits people the wrong way, but it's actually a pretty simple legal principle that has been imbued in the common law and the civil law in the United States of America. And it is and it is used every day in civil courts when people do things that harm other people, they repair the damage that they did in a number of different ways. And so uh, as these deficits in our institutions become clear to us, um, police reform is one of them, uh, institutional banking reform is another, and we can go through a whole host of them. Just the general idea is an idea that, that, is, that is too late uh, for us, that we, I think we have to really work through in a thoughtful, open way and give each other room to try to figure out what it means to go forward. And, 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 and I'm sorry, Pena. 
Well, I was, I was going to ask you, um, just to, to go back to, to the health disparities we're seeing with COVID-19. I mean, folks who read your book know that your father actually died of a virus that was respiratory in nature because when he went to the hospital, his complaints weren't taken seriously. And so how are you, you know, as you've been doing your work with Robin Hood and addressing, you know, relief in New York and in other places, how are you thinking about how all of these systems work together, particularly in the health, in the health context? Yeah, um, and, 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 and thank you, Kuna, because you're right. I, I think um, for so much of our work, uh, for me, it is personal. And there's no place that that shows itself more than the work that we do within the health space. Um, because when I was around four years old, my father died of a virus that was treatable uh, if it was taken seriously. And when he went to the hospital, uh, I guess his facial hair was a little too unkept. And questions to my mother began like, is he prone to exaggeration? Hmm. And, uh, and he was released with the instructions to get some rest. And if it gets worse to come back and uh and five hours after he was released he collapsed down the stairs and died in front of all of us and um you know his life mattered and his complaints weren't taken seriously and we see how this continues to play itself out uh you know you know specifically when it comes to health disparities and we see how all of those things have been long ingrained and you know and and it, it goes it actually plays into exactly what what you were, you all were just talking about uh, about how do we address this moment in health and in these other areas and these other dimensions and the reality is um you know part of that means a level of truth that we have to have as a society and understand the trauma that our realities have actually caused. The, the fact that we have such massive health disparities, like some of the ones that I mentioned before, that's not by accident. Right. It's, it's, not, it's not because one group just chooses not to take care of themselves or, or, or anything along those lines. We have structures that have been long time ingrained and put in place and laws that have allowed for these levels of disparities to take place. We can't talk about everything that's happening within our society without talking about the impact of everything from redlining and discriminatory lending and discriminatory housing. We can't talk about this without understanding the fact that in the neighborhoods that we support and, 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 and work in and fund right now, in the South Bronx, one of the areas that's one of the, one of the, you know, the core areas that Robin does a lot of his core work, that half of the children there are growing up with, growing up with asthma. Is that an accident? You know, so, so when we're looking at the case of, 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 of Freddie Gray and his life, and what we talked about in, in the book Five Days, you know, where oftentimes we can talk about the tragedy of his death, but the reality is it's important to talk about the tragedy of his life. The fact that here is a person who was born two months premature, addicted to heroin, a mother who never made it to high school, who was raising him and his twin sister on, on, on her own, when he finally gained enough weight to leave the hospital, they moved into North Cary Street, which is a housing project over in West Baltimore. And that house, along with over 400 others in 2009, was listed in a 2009 uh, lawsuit because of the endemic levels of lead that were inside of that house. You know, the CDC indicates that, that five microbes in every, in every deciliter of, uh, of lead in every deciliter of blood is enough to make, give a person cognitive damage, lasting cognitive damage. Freddie Gray at 36. And so the reality is, is that we are now talking about a young person who was born underweight, addicted to heroin, poisoned by lead. And by this point in his life, he's two years old. What chance did he have in the first place? And so this argument behind, well, the way we have to address this is, you know, that to address poverty or to address inequities, people just have to work harder. How hard would he have to have worked in order to overcome that? And so this, this idea of, 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 of how, do we, how are we going to be proactive about it or, or a conversation around fairness, which I cannot tell you how amazingly inaccurate and offensive a conversation about fairness comes in when we look at the historical unfairness of the way so many things have been, so many of these histories have been planned out. 
become incredibly important and not just because it benefits or because it supports one group. It's about the fact that right now child poverty is costing a trillion dollars every single year to this country. It's about the fact that, as, as, as the mayor said, we're never going to be able to live up to our, not just our, our ideals, but our actual operational greatness if we're not willing to be able to attack the challenges that we are facing and the disparities that we're facing with the same level of discipline and the same level of courageousness and the same level of, frankly, intentionality as these problems were put there in the first place, because there was an intentionality that was placed in the way we now, that is structured the way we now have so many disparities and discrepancies that have impacted all of us. And, and for many of us, how it has impacted us personally from our youngest days on this planet. Yeah. Uh, beautiful, but Kuna, may I respond to that? Sure, please. First of all, Wes, thank you. I'm sorry about your daddy. Thank you. Um, but but to, to, to make a, a, a finer point on everything that you said, and I completely agree with you, uh, and, to, and to give some visuals to this, back to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's sense that, that racism is like dust in the air and you put a light on it and then you see that it's everywhere. Sometimes white people hear, well, institutional racism, you know, biases, I don't know what that is. What does that really mean? How does that manifest itself? Where could I possibly see it? And of course, like Confederate monuments, we walk by them every day without really understanding that not only symbolism, but impact. But for example, in the Bronx, Wes, where you were doing a lot of your work, if you went into the Bronx, uh, even today, a couple of weeks ago, and you went to the hospitals in the Bronx and you looked at the equipment, the buildings, how backed up they are, how overwhelmed they are, and then you go into Manhattan, and you go, wow, those hospitals are beautiful. They look like they have a lot of capacity. They have a lot of ventilators. They're right across, they're just real, they're a mile apart from each other, but they assume could be a world apart. In the South, I was uh, with E. Pluribus Unum traveling around, interviewing, talking to people about things. Uh, we were in Virginia and we were at a, a healthcare clinic talking to African Americans. And many of them said, you know, we don't have access to health care. And I said immediately, oh, you mean access to Medicaid, which was one of them. They said, yes, but uh, more deeply, we don't like going to the doctor. Really? Why, why don't you like going to the doctor? Well, most of the doctors are white. That's interesting. Who gets into, who gets educated? Who gets into medical school? How many African-American doctors are there? And I said, well, explain it to me a little bit more because I don't, I've never heard that before. As, as a white person. Well, I, we don't trust the doctors. Why don't you trust the doctors? Well, they don't think that we're being honest with them. They don't like us. They see us in a certain way. It, the exact story that Wes just told about his dad, or they don't prescribe for us the way that other people prescribe for us. And so that's uncomfortable for us. All right. So the second thing is in COVID, if you think about where healthcare clinics are, where rural hospitals are, then you get into the institutional uh, unwillingness to fund the physical facilities and the doctors. That's all institutional stuff that has to start early. That, that has the consequence of somebody like Wes's father, unfortunately being turned away and then his life being lost. That's in, that, that's like, if you shine the light on it, that is exactly. So you say to yourself, well, what can we do to change that? There are actually specific things that we can advocate for that will change that. How are you going to get more young people to become doctors, like at Xavier University uh, in New Orleans. How are you going to fund hospitals? Why, how are you gonna place them in rural areas, it, especially in the South where 54% of African-Americans live and if they don't have access. So the same thing, exact same thing could be said about police reform. It could be said about economic reform. It could be say about environmental justice. It is, I don't wanna say it's all the same thing because of different subject matters, but the essence of it is exactly the same. And so what Wes said, what we first need in this country is an acknowledgement that that is so. And I can tell you from having done extensive interviews in the South and extensive polling, and I have reason to believe this is true across the country, as a general rule, this is not everybody, but as a general rule, white people think that black people are where they are because they chose to be there and because of choices in their life and not institutional bias and not the environment that they grow up in and basically walk away from it and said, I don't have anything to do with that. Well, that could not be further from the truth because who is in power, and in this instance, the president and the Senate and Congress and governors and most legislators are most overwhelmingly white. And if 
more, white people don't generally understand this, then how in the world could you fix a problem that you don't fully comprehend? And willful ignorance is not an excuse about this stuff anymore. And I think that what's happening in the country right now, if I might, Wes, and I, I certainly can't and don't pretend to speak for any African Americans in the country, but many of my friends have told me I felt like that was me on the ground and that knee was on my neck. And so I, th I think that that's not an over-exaggeration of where we are in the country. And I think we white people have to stop and say, what am I hearing? What am I seeing? What didn't I understand? What, where, where, is this, where is this anger and this frustration and this passion coming from if I didn't understand it before? Can I understand it now? And what can I do in my personal life, in my community, in the organization that I run to try to find a way to repair the damage that has been done and fix what has been broken. That is the moment that we are being called into. And the question about whether this is a different moment or not, I mean, who the heck knows? I mean, let's, I hope it is. I hope we choose to go in one path or the other, because from my perspective, there's only two paths. There's that way and there's that way. You know, there's backwards and then there's forward. And I don't think it's that unclear about what needs to be done and how we need to get there. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, you talk a lot of bit in your book about the um, resistance you got from folks when you were looking to take down the, or when you were taking down the Confederate statues um, and all of the pieces of institutional racism that, that form part of that resistance. We're in a, an election year and the kinds of policy responses that you have Talk, you know, talked about in the, in, in the uh, policy document put out by the fund are probably going to meet some resistance, particularly from white people when you talk about how they, particularly anything that's race specific. And so what, how do you, for, given your own journey and your own experience, how do you talk to white people? How do you persuade people in general that these kinds of policies address racial equity are good for all of us? Well, it's an excellent question. First of all, the entire time that I was mayor, I tried to do this in policy. I was clearly imperfect. We clearly could have done more, but we, we were intentional about trying to find a way to use the power of the government and the money of the government, that is to say the power of the people and the money of the people to lift everybody up. And that was true about police reform. Our police department was under a federal consent decree for the eight years that I was mayor. And we systematically went about trying to rehire, retrain, resupervise our police department. We put things in place like early warning systems so that if a police officer was getting out of the way, a bunch of times a year, you would know that and say that officer needs retraining. We had something that we put in place called EPIC, which is, called, which is an acronym for ethical policing, uh, is courageous. That was an attempt to create a new culture in the police department so that when a number of different officers were out and about and one of them did something wrong, the other one stopped him didn't not say about it, didn't cover it up, didn't write a false police report. And we wanted to make the new culture is your job is, and you're going to be praised. And so if you think it had that been in place and had that been used uh, a couple of days ago, we, we would have a very different circumstance. And now you see this playing out itself in a positive way with police departments and negative across America and how some police departments are responding to the protests. As you're watching some police departments that are really well-trained that are engaging with the protesters, all right, et cetera, et cetera, and they're doing it the right way. They do not see, as the president sees, the streets of America as a battleground and the protesters as enemy combatants, which is so incredibly offensive. And Wes, you're the, you're the veteran here. You can speak to this perversion uh, of the abuse of power as it relates to the military, and there are lots of other examples. So there are specific things that you can do. And in New Orleans, one of the things that we have a hard, we have a hard time uh, I realize we have a hard time understanding is the difference between equality and equity. And this notion, if I could try to explain this visually, that if you have two glasses of water and in this glass, the water is this high and in this glass, the water is this high. Of course, this being the white community and this being the black community, that you could take a new glass of water and, and try, to, try to pour the same amount in each one of these glasses. And when you finish, they will still be the distance between the two where the idea with equity is, why don't we fill this one up first and get here and then we'll move forward together. All right, that's the simplest visual explanation I can give you. Uh, and of course, some of that actually is completely directed towards create, I mean, fixing problems of the past. So that if you were redesigning a healthcare delivery system, who has access to insurance? If you're building clinics, 
what communities are you putting them in? Do African-American women, for example, in a particular neighborhood in New Orleans have access to mammograms that they didn't have before so they can get early screening for cancer? Yes, because that's equitable. It makes perfect sense. And then you, you can use the same things um, on, on almost every policy you're talking about. If the third way, for example, was thinking about, well, tell me about a tax policy that, that might be helpful going forward, you should really ask yourself, I want to look at this from an equitable perspective, from the lens of the people that I really want to lift up and ask yourself whether or not there's going to be an unintentional negative consequence. And if you look at it that way, then you, it's like shining the light on the dust. You will begin to see that, oh my goodness, I didn't necessarily intend that, but that consequence is not going to be good and that's not going to achieve the equitable outcome. So let's rethink how we're going to do that. DBE programs are this way. If you go talk to small African-American businesses, uh, folks that have been out there hustling and bustling, you say, look, what do I need? You'll normally hear an entrepreneur say, look, I couldn't go to school and get an MBA from Johns Hopkins or Tulane. And I didn't get you know, all the expertise about marketing and finance. I need that kind of help. Secondly, my banker you know, doesn't really look at me the right way when I go in there. I need somebody that's gonna extend credit to me. When we have you know, funds that actually wanna invest in businesses, it doesn't help that they're just on the West Coast and the East Coast and not in the neighborhoods in partnership with, let's say, Morehouse or Spelman or any other African-American institution. So, of course, what happens? If you don't have access to the stuff that helps makes you good, it's harder for you to get where you need to be. Those are very specific things that require design, structure, money, and nurturing, just like anybody else. And that, those are the kinds of equitable approaches that you can take to, making, to creating the kinds of opportunities for everybody that we're talking about. Yeah. So I'm going to take a oh, Wes, did you want to say something? No, I think I'm only briefly, I, I think that's right. And I think what's being required right now is for us to really think about what is the role of government in all this? Mm -hmm. um, where when we think about the things that government can do immediately to be able to address this, there are certain things that only government can actually address and pull together. So for example, we're talking about the enhancement of basic work supports and also supports for children particularly for children who are growing up and living in poverty. If you, you know, a thing and, and a program such as SNAP, but also if we're talking about making basic adjustments to things like the child tax credit, right? Basic adjustments on the child tax credit, for example, uh, can make sure that for the millions of children who are actually left out of the placement we're in right now. So for example, 53% of African-American children do not receive any form of CTC, which is insane because it means we have a system and a structure that was built to, to support people that is not supporting people, right? Basic adjustments that we can make on that. Another big thing that government can actually do in this moment is also understand that they are the only ones that can really focus on scale and much of the, most, much of the more innovative things that are happening are actually happening at local levels right now. And what they need is actually support to scale. And it goes back to the role in this interplay between the private sector, philanthropy, and all these other things, where philanthropy can address a very human need right now. Philanthropy can actually go in and support programs. I think about ours. You know, we support over 300 uh, community organizations and community programs. Uh, every single year, we, we will receive not just financial support, but technical assistance, management assistance, all these other things. But the reality is, is that if you look at the larger philanthropic budget, the larger giving budget from around the world, you know, from around the country, it hovers at around $700 billion a year. And we know when half of that capital goes towards colleges and universities and alma maters, half of what's left from that goes towards homes of worship and hospitals. So you know you're now looking at approximately $150 billion that goes towards everything else, right? Veterans issues, seniors, young people, poverty, uh, uh, racial justice, $150 billion. The reality is that is never going to be enough to be able to solve the problem. It's enough to be able to create catalytic capital. It's enough to create best practices. It's enough to be able to present, present government with options that we should then put serious scalable capital into fixing some of these larger structural problems. And so it does come back to how is government thinking differently about itself and different thinking, thinking differently about partnerships in this moment. And some of it's not even radical. For example, SNAP, this is one, ex one example. There are a lot of kids in this country that are hungry. Um, they're, they're not in school. We have to feed kids. There's a lot of different mechanisms to do this through the USDA 
or through CDBG programs, et cetera, et cetera. The one, the, the, the pipeline that's the quickest and the fastest is expanding SNAP and then waivers from the USDA so that schools can feed kids during the summer. One thing, it's already there. This is just a matter of saying, do I have the willpower and the desire and the need to make sure that no kid goes hungry? And that, that is not a radical idea, but that is something that's gonna help kids in America in the way that Wes said. The same thing is with the child tax credit or the earned income tax credit. All of these things really are different kind of songs on, in the album of making sure that people have the basic resources that they need so that they can access the opportunities that should be available to them. So none of this is radical. This is really just about what is your view of life? And do you think that we're all in this together or we're not? And who gives and who gets? And so back to what the original question you asked me, if in fact American citizens are enemy combatants and American soil is the battleground, then it's a war and a zero sum game between me and you. So where does that lead you to? Over militarization. That's what that narrative gets you. But if in fact we're all equal American citizens and we have a, a, a just a grievance about what we're not getting, and if we all get, we're all gonna be better. And not only are we not enemy combatants, but we're fellow patriots doing our patriotic duty well, that takes you to a completely different way of dealing with the problem. So who controls the narrative and what story is really told and what the honest story is about what happened is critically important to getting us from where we are to where all of us need to be. Maybe not where we want to be. I know people don't like to be told, you know, what, what, what they need to do. I mean, politicians are used to telling people what they want. That's not this really moment. And I think that many of us have to sit in an uncomfortable space about thinking about not what we want, but what we need and what is necessary. And that is going to force us to really think hard, look really inside of us about who we are as America. And when we, when we make that decision, we need to make sure that our policies, our actions, our advocacy, our friendships move us to that ideal, not away from it. And we have to be honest and truthful with each other about it. Um, we have time for, for one or two questions. Uh, Wes, this one's for you. Um, first, how do you think about or feel about truth and reconciliation processes? And if you were designing one for Baltimore, how would you structure it? I love that question. Um, and thank you for it. And, and the answer is uh, how I feel about it. I feel like it is a prerequisite. I, I, I'm not sure how we move forward until we first understand and acknowledge and wrestle with how we got here in the first place. I think our history is important to understand because you know, we're not saying that our history is important to acknowledge, but until we acknowledge it and come up with that pathway, we're gonna continue to be enslaved by it. Uh, I, I, um, I actually took a trip to Colombia. Um, this was, I guess about six months ago. And um, I had a chance to go to Medellin. Mm -hmm. And Medellin, you know, I learned in doing history about it was a place where, uh, where literally uh, two decades ago, it was the most violent place in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the most violent place on this planet. And in 2015, it was also named as the most innovative city in the world. And so I was fascinated with this idea of, so how do you go from literally the most violent place in the world to the most innovative city in the world in a process of about two decades? And I had a chance to visit a museum, uh, a museum uh, there called El Museo del, del, del Memoria. And it's a museum that is exclusively devoted to understanding the history and the truth and the pain that existed. And that so many people there are still very much dealing and wrestling with that pain. There was one room in particular where they had these lights and a light would go on and then go off and a light would go on and go off. It looked like a galaxy. It looked like just stars because they were everywhere. And as you go in closer, you realize these lights are not lights, they're pictures. And a picture would flash up and a picture would flash down and a picture would flash up and then it'd be in color. And then everyone, and then it would pause a second and then every picture, every face in there would go, would, uh, would, would stay lit except for one face that would go into black and white. That was a person who was either killed or is still missing. Mm. It was so powerful. And the thing about it that was really powerful was it didn't say what happened. It didn't say what side they were fighting on. It didn't say, it didn't give a full narrative. It just showed this is a human being. This was a father 
This was a son. This was a nephew. This was a wife. This was a daughter. But someone who we lost. And it forced us to wrestle with our own humanity walking into that room. And so it's something where I think about, you take the city of Baltimore, and it's one of the things I actually you know, talked about in five days where in this, if you look at Iraq, if you look at Iraq and Afghanistan over, over the time that we've been fighting there, right? Now close to two decades we've been fighting over there. Uh, there have been, there have been a, a little over 3,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines who we have lost in direct combat. If you look at the city of Baltimore over that same time period, the number is we've had about 2,800 homicides. So about the same number of people who have died from homicide in the 25th largest city in America as we had soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines who have been killed in combat during the same time period. If we cannot understand the trauma that a society deals with in that, if we're not, if we're not interested in delving into the pain of why so many of those frameworks take place, why so many of those systems and structures, why they were created, and why it has forced these conditions that we are then dealing with, then we're not willing to actually delve into a real solution on it. So I think it is something that is necessary, it is imperative. I think it is something that needs to be both physical in manifestation, but also I think there's something that needs to be a larger both curriculum and a larger implementation processes that takes place all throughout the country because I think our entire country is harmed and, 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 and healing from it. And I think it is something that if we're saying that how do we think about a, a, a slices and parts of a national process of pulling us together and thinking about a way forward, I think it is absolutely a prerequisite if we want to get there smartly. Yeah. And could I, may I jump on it? Yes, First please. of all, Baltimore is a great city. And, and Wes, I know that you are a part of rebuilding that city. And he's exactly right. But I want to follow the Medellin model and the metric that he gave you about the wars. The United States of America helped Medellin stand itself back up. We actually gave them $3 billion to help reform their police departments so that they could help with the Medellin government that led the effort to create that umbrella of safety that was, um, that was led by the Medellin people. So the American government gave money to a place that worked through turning a place from violence into a place of much more safety and peace. All right. So when, when people in America say, oh, well, the federal government shouldn't give a city money, we, did, we actually gave a city money. It just wasn't in the United States of America that accomplished that incredible feat. That's number one. The second thing is, on the issue of violence, Wes gave you a number where the number of deaths from Afghanistan uh, and Iraq matched the number of deaths on the streets of Baltimore. But the number is actually much more egregious than that. Since 1980, since 1980, in the United States of America, 630,000 American citizens have been killed on the streets of America. That is dramatically higher than all of the deaths that American soldiers suffered in all of the wars, all of World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera, all. And so I, I look at that and think, well, wait, not, not that I, I, I mean, I really appreciate what we in the country do to support our, our military men and women, especially the gentleman that's sitting uh, with me right now and respect that. But if you think about the amount of money that we have spent to do that, much of which you arguably was necessary and say, if I just had a portion of that and I use that money to do actually what the United States does to rebuild cities that our military has been in overseas, West knows this, in Afghanistan and Iraq, the Department of Defense had a huge amount of discretionary money to rebuild, as they should have, sewer systems, schools, healthcare delivery systems. It makes you understand that it's, that model is actually possible, especially if it's applied in the United States of America with cities. And this is particularly poignant because as we sit here today, the United States Senate is refusing to move a bill that actually provides resources to state and local governments to do this very thing. Right. So, so there is, this is not amorphous stuff. It's not like there's no answer. It's like, yes, there is an answer. And guess what? There is money. It is just a matter of attitude and principle and vision about what America really is. And to the, to the final institutional point, if we don't invest in the kinds of institutions that lift children up or create healthcare to support people or give economic opportunity, then we therefore have an institutional bias that produces a negative consequence 
that allows us to be alienated from each other, which creates no justice. And so there's no peace. It is, it is, a, it is a line that runs all the way through it that somehow people refuse to look at. And because they refuse to look at or shine the light on it, they don't see it. Yeah, I I, I want to just echo what the two of you just said. For folks who um, don't know, I actually started my career in the foreign service doing economic development in other countries and saw, particularly in post-conflict countries, and I was in Iraq and in South Africa, countries that had come through conflicts, racial crisis, et cetera, and there's no way that we would ever recommend to them and we never recommend it to them that they do development the way that we do it here. Everything that we are saying that we need in the United States is, are things that we do overseas and that we fund overseas. And so it's always puzzled me that we could not get the political will to do those things here. Um, and so with that, I know I have kept you two and our audience over some time, and I just wanted to take the moment to thank you both for this fantastic conversation. Um, I hope that I can uh, convince you to come back again, because I'm sure that this conversation will be ongoing. And thank you, everyone, for, um, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wes. God thank bless. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks all.